This is the last of three anatomy lectures that cover the pupillary pathways. Today we're going to cover the sympathetic pathway. Problems with the sympathetic pathway to the head cause meiosis since there is a lack of innervation to the dilator muscle which counteracts the sphincter muscle. The anisocoria that's present will be greater in dim illumination. There will be a normal reaction to light. If the anisocoria is worse in dim illumination and the pupils react normally to light, then you either have a sympathetic problem or physiologic anisocoria. With a sympathetic problem, there will be a dilation lag. With a dilation lag, there's slow and incomplete dilation when going from light to dark illumination. And that dilation lag will help differentiate Horner syndrome from physiologic anisocoria. Normally, a pupil will dilate within five seconds of the light being off. The sympathetic activity increases and the parasympathetic activity decreases, causing the pupil to dilate. With Horner syndrome, there's reduced sympathetic activity to the dilator muscle, so relaxation of the sphincter muscle is the only stimulus to dilate the eye. Because the pupil takes longer to dilate, there will be more anisocoria after five seconds versus 15 seconds. And a dilation lag does not occur with physiologic anisocoria. This is a patient with a right Horner syndrome. You can see that the pupil is smaller on the right side. In the top image, we're shining light into both eyes. Then we remove that light and start counting to 15. After five seconds without the light, you can see that the anisocoria is greater than 15 seconds after removing the light. That's because that right pupil takes a longer time to dilate. Another aspect of Horner's syndrome is ptosis. There's damage to the innervation of the smooth muscle in the upper eyelid, Mueller's muscle. There's also lack of innervation to the lower eyelid, causing the lower eyelid to raise slightly. Because the upper eyelid is coming down and the lower eyelid moves up, the eye looks more closed. This gives the appearance of pseudo and ophthalmos, where the eye appears to be sunken back into the orbit. Another aspect of Horner's syndrome is facial anhydrosis. This occurs with damage to either the central or preganglionic neurons. It won't happen with a postganglionic lesion because the fibers that regulate sweating, except for a small area on the medial forehead, follow the external carotid artery whereas the pupil fibers follow the internal carotid artery. Iris heterochromia can be seen in a congenital Horner syndrome, and you can see that in this patient with a right Horner syndrome. Again, the pupil is smaller on the right side, and the upper eyelid is drooping a bit. This is a 
congenital Horner syndrome, and there's less pigmentation of the right iris. Sympathetic innervation is necessary for the development and maintenance of iris melanocyte pigmentation. So normal iris pigmentation fails to develop in Horner syndrome, so the affected side will have a lighter colored eye. So we covered the ptosis and pseudo and ophthalmos, as well as the facial anhydrosis or lack of sweating and the iris heterochromia if the condition is congenital. So let's talk about the pathway of the sympathetic system to the pupil. It's helpful to be able to localize where a lesion is in a patient with Horner syndrome so that we can determine proper diagnosis and management. There are three parts of the sympathetic pathway. There's a central neuron, a preganglionic neuron, and a postganglionic neuron. The central neuron starts in the hypothalamus. That nerve then travels down the brain stem to the spinal cord. It synapses in the cervical spinal cord. So that's our central pathway. Things that can cause a Horner's syndrome due to a central lesion include a stroke or multiple sclerosis. Once the fibers synapse in the cervical spinal cord, our preganglionic neuron starts. These fibers leave the spinal cord and enter the chest. They'll travel over the apex of the lung. And then they go upward to the superior cervical ganglion. Causes of a second order or a pre-ganglionic corner syndrome include thoracic injury, or metastatic disease in the chest called pancoast tumor. This is found at the apex of the lung. Within the superior cervical ganglion, the fibers synapse again. And now we have the postganglionic neuron. Our postganglionic neuron follows the internal carotid artery. It follows that all the way to the cavernous sinus. Within the cavernous sinus, the sympathetic fibers travel a short time with cranial nerve six and then go to cranial nerve five. They follow the ophthalmic division of cranial nerve five to the nasociliary nerve.
from the nasal ciliary nerve, they go to the long ciliary nerves. And that goes to the iris dilator muscle. Within the cavernous sinus, fibers that go to Mueller's muscle will follow cranial nerve three. And that follows the superior division of cranial nerve three to Mueller's muscle. Causes of a post-ganglionic corner syndrome include a skull fracture. They can be vasculopathic. And it can occur with a carotid artery dissection. When the Horner syndrome is due to a carotid artery dissection, this is an emergent situation since these patients are much more likely to have a stroke. They must be hospitalized and given blood thinners. Here you can see the sympathetic pathway. The sympathetic pathway starts in the hypothalamus. Those fibers travel down the brain stem all the way to the cervical spinal cord. At that point, the preganglionic fibers start and those travel over the apex of the lung and back up to the superior cervical ganglion. From the superior cervical ganglion, the postganglionic fibers start. These fibers leave the superior cervical ganglion and follow the internal carotid artery up to the cavernous sinus. Then they follow the long ciliary nerve to the iris dilator. And they also follow cranial nerve three to Mueller's muscle. Note that the fibers that control sweating of the face break off and follow the external carotid artery. They don't take the same pathway as the fibers going to the pupil. Pharmacologic testing can be used to diagnose Horner syndrome. It can also be used to determine the site of a lesion. To diagnose Horner syndrome, Traditionally, we use topical cocaine eye drops. This is an indirect acting adrenergic agonist. It prevents the reuptake of norepinephrine. Normally, Cocaine will cause dilation of the pupil. And this will occur within 30 to 60 minutes. However, if you have a Horner's syndrome, you will get no dilation of the pupil. In a normal eye, 
you have a preganglionic fiber that secretes acetylcholine. That synapses with a postganglionic fiber that secretes norepinephrine and goes to the dilator muscle in the eye. If you put a drop of cocaine in the eye, the norepinephrine is going to stay in the synapse longer. So we're gonna get increased norepinephrine in the synapse, and then we get dilation of the pupil. However, if a person has Horner syndrome, again, they still have the preganglionic fiber that secretes acetylcholine, and that attaches to a postganglionic fiber. But in this case, there's no norepinephrine in the synapse. So you put a drop of cocaine in the eye and cocaine is supposed to stop the reuptake of norepinephrine but if there's no norepinephrine in the synapse you get no dilation so this is how you tell whether or not you have a horner syndrome once you have determined that there is a Horner's syndrome, you will use hydroxyamphetamine to determine if the damage is preganglionic or postganglionic. Keep in mind that you can't differentiate between a central and a preganglionic lesion. This only differentiates between pre and postganglionic lesions. It will tell you whether or not there is a postganglionic lesion. Testing with hydroxyamphetamine needs to be performed after you know that you have a Horner syndrome. 20% of people have physiologic anisocoria. In addition, there is a lot of people with ptosis that has nothing to do with a Horner syndrome. So chances are good that you can have a small pupil in an eye with a ptosis and not have Horner's syndrome, since both of those conditions by themselves are quite common. So you do need to verify that the patient truly has a Horner syndrome prior to trying to localize the lesion. Like cocaine, hydroxyamphetamine is an indirect acting adrenergic agonist, but its mechanism of action is different than cocaine. Hydroxyamphetamine causes the release of norepinephrine. So if you have a Horner syndrome in the preganglionic fiber, so we're going to have a lesion here. This is a preganglionic Horner syndrome. The postganglionic fiber is still viable and will contain norepinephrine. It just doesn't have anything to cause the release of that norepinephrine. So hydroxyamphetamine comes along. So we put a drop of hydroxyamphetamine in the eye and it will actually cause the release of norepinephrine. And then we get dilation of the pupil. If there is a post ganglionic Horner syndrome, this is a post ganglionic 
lesion. Now, norepinephrine is not going to be stored in the postganglionic nerve. In order for the neurotransmitter to be at the axon terminal, there needs to be communication between the cell body where the neurotransmitter is produced and the axonal terminal where the transmitter is released. This doesn't happen with a post-ganglionic lesion. So there won't be any norepinephrine in the axon terminal. So if we put a drop of hydroxyamphetamine in the eye, there's not going to be any norepinephrine to be released. So therefore we get no dilation of the pupil. One acronym to help remember what happens with these drops is the acronym no, no, post. So if you do not get a dilation with cocaine and you don't get a dilation with hydroxyamphetamine, that means you have a post ganglionic lesion. Even topical cocaine can be difficult to obtain. Therefore, alternative diagnostic agents are commonly used to test for Horner syndrome. Apriclonidine is an alpha adrenergic agonist. It's typically used in the treatment of glaucoma. It decreases aqueous production. Normally, the drop is too weak to cause dilation. However, in a patient with Horner's syndrome, the dilator will be super sensitive, so you will get dilation of the pupil in response to apriclonidine. And this will occur regardless of whether it's a pre or a post ganglionic Horner syndrome. So here is a Horner syndrome before and after apriclonidine. You can see in the top image that the patient has a right ptosis and the right pupil is smaller than the left. Once we put the drops in, you can see that the right eye has a very robust reaction to the apoclonidine. You get reversal of the anisocoria. So now the right pupil is larger. You'll also get widening of the palpebral fissure due to hypersensitivity of Mueller's muscle. Phenylephrine may be helpful in diagnosing a post-ganglionic Horner syndrome. With a normal pupil, you get only minimal dilation. With a post-ganglionic Horner syndrome, the pupil will dilate quickly and larger due to the supersensitivity of the sympathomimetic agents. You would expect only minimal dilation if there's a preganglionic lesion. About 20% of the population has physiologic anisocoria. This is a normal difference in pupil size. It's often more apparent in dim illumination. The pupils will have a normal reaction to light and they will dilate normally. There's no dilation lag associated with physiologic anisocoria.
With physiologic anisocoria, the pupils generally have less than one millimeter difference between the two eyes. And the amount of anisocoria can fluctuate through the day or even reverse which pupil is larger. This person has physiologic anisocoria. You can see that there is no ptosis and the anisocoria is slightly more evident in dim illumination, but the pupils dilate and constrict very robustly to light. There is quite a bit of information to remember with the pupils. One way that might help to put this together so you can study is to make a table describing the pupillary defects that will occur with a given lesion. So you'll put the damaged area over here. You'll have structures like the optic nerve and the optic tract and the posterior commissure and the edinger westphal nucleus and cranial nerve three. Then across the top, you'll put, if the light is shined in the right eye and left eye, right eye, left eye, for each one of these structures, what's going to happen with the direct response, what's going to happen with the consensual response, and what's going to happen with the near response. And we'll need to specify the side the lesion occurs on. Drawing out a flow chart may help to fill in that chart and determine what pupil dysfunctions you'll get depending on where the lesion is. To draw out a simplified version of our pupillary pathway, we will draw the left retina at the top of the screen and the right retina at the top of the screen here. That is going to take information back to the optic nerve. Half of those fibers are going to cross over to the opposite side. And I'm drawing two lines here for the fibers that are going to cross to the opposite side in the chiasm, because remember that there's more fibers nasally than temporally. So that's why we're gonna get a contralateral relative afferent pupillary defect if we have a complete optic tract lesion. Here is our optic tract fibers. So we're gonna only have one green here and two red since we have more fibers from the opposite retina. And then on this side, we'll have one red and two greens. Those are going to come together at the pretectal nuclei. So they're gonna go through the brachium of the superior colliculus. From the pretectal nuclei, the fibers are going to go to the edinger westphal Remember that some of the fibers are going to 
cross over to the opposite Edinger West ball, and some are going to stay on the same side. And this is a pretty small area. So generally all of these fibers are going to be damaged if we have a lesion in that pretectal to Edinger West ball nuclear area. Then from the Edinger West ball nucleus, we are going to take cranial nerve three up to the sphincter muscle. So we still have fibers that are green and red since both of them had input into each of the Edinger West ball nuclei. But the other thing that's going to happen here is we have our near response coming in at the level of the Edinger West ball nuclei. So we're going to add an extra arrow here. So we can use this to fill out the chart that we made. So let's say that we have a lesion of the right cranial nerve three. So if we draw our lesion here of the right cranial nerve three, and then we ask ourselves, we're going to shine light into the right eye what's going to happen with the direct response. So if we shine light into the right eye, that's going to come back to the optic nerve. Some of that's going to go over to this pretectal nucleus. Some of the signal is going to come over to this pretectal nucleus. The signal is going to make it to the edinger westfall nucleus. But once we get to our lesion, the signal goes to the left sphincter, but the signal doesn't make it to the right sphincter because we have a lesion there. So if we shine light on the right retina, we're not going to get a direct response in the right sphincter. So we'll put a no here. If we shine light in the left eye, notice that we will get a response in the left sphincter muscle. So if we shine light on in the left retina, it's going to come all the way through here and nothing blocks the signal from getting to the left iris sphincter. Now we're going to ask ourselves, how about the consensual response? So here we are going to shine a light on the left retina and see if it gets through to the right sphincter. Because on our consensual response, we're looking at the opposite eye. So we shine a light in the left retina and everything gets through to the optic nerve, gets through the chiasm, it gets through the pretectal nuclei, it gets through the edinger westphal nuclei, but then our consensual response does not get to the sphincter. Nothing can get to the sphincter because there's damage here. So we have light shined in the left eye and we get no consensual response. If we shine light in the right eye, but we're looking at the left sphincter to see if we have a consensual response here, again, the signal gets all the way through without hitting our lesion. So we will get a consensual response when we shine light in the right eye. We get a consensual response in the left iris sphincter. Now, what about the near response? 
our near response comes straight into the edge of your west ball nuclei but it's not going to get through to the sphincter either because the damage is between the edge of your west ball and the sphincter muscle so if we have the patient look at a near target the right sphincter will not respond how about the left sphincter well if we look at near again that's going to go to the edinger west vault and go to the left sphincter without a problem so we will get a near response in the left eye I'll let you guys fill out the rest of this table based on the things that we've learned over the last few lectures and this drawing, this simplified drawing that we have here.